Good afternoon and welcome. I am Moises Naim with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm substituting for uh, our annual meeting, uh, uh, Latin American meeting co-chair Stanley Mota, who apologizes he had to leave uh, for a, because of a family emergency. So we are here for a conversation with David Rubinstein. He is the founder, 27 years ago, he founded the Carlyle Group. Today, the Carlyle Group has $190 billion under management. It operates uh, all kinds of uh, uh, asset management uh, investment funds, yeah, also funds of funds uh, in different industries, in different regions. And uh, he has been selected like the man of the year uh, by a very large number of magazines. He's usually on the cover of one of these magazines. It, it wasn't people, though, for uh, <laughs> Sexiest Man Alive, I can assure you. <laughs> and one of these days, he's going to be at People. Uh, <laughs> Um, and so I, I live in Washington, D.C., and every time I pick up the newspaper, there's a story about David Rubenstein. Some of the stories is about, are about how much money he makes and how big the Carlyle is and the deals. And other stories, even more frequent, is how much money he's giving away. Uh, he's uh, one of the very significant philanthropists uh, in the world today. And just to give you an example, he funded the, the, the Washington Monument, uh, was in dire need of repairs. And uh, David uh, came up uh, with the funds to do that. He is also uh, a, a donor is in, and in the board of a very large number of institutions. Just a sample, uh, the, is the chairman of the Kennedy Center in Washington. Um, at Duke University is uh, one of the trustees, uh, the Economic Club in Washington. He's re regent of the Smithsonian. Uh, Vice Chair of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Brookings, uh, Lincoln Center, is a trustee, John Hopkins, and so on. Uh, I, I was the beneficiary of one of his uh, uh, philanthropic endeavors because uh, the, the group of 50 uh, which I run, which is a group of uh, leading business people in Latin America, we were invited by David to go to the National Archives where he hosted us. And the reason he invited us there is because he had just paid $21 million for a copy of the Carta Magna. So let's start there. Let's start with that and then we'll go uh, first to how you, 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 you give your money away and then we'll move quickly to how you make money. Okay. Uh, <laughs> tell us, why the Carta Magna? Well, uh, let's, let me explain. Um, my background is, um, you know, one that uh, is, is a lawyer, and so I obviously knew the Magna Carta. It was the document that was the, you know, inspiration for the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution of the United States. And uh, it was an 800-year-old document. There are about 17 of them left. Uh, they uh, were the first document that really in the Western world gave certain people certain rights, the right to trial by jury and so forth. And um, there was one copy in private hands that Ross Perot had bought years ago, put it in the United States, and he had it at the National Archives, and he decided to put it up for auction. So this was the only copy that would ever be in private hands. I decided to go to the auction and try to buy it and keep it in the United States because it was the inspiration for those documents. So I went to the auction, and I'm not an art collector, but I uh, showed up, and they put me in a little room, and I started bidding, and if you get anybody's been in an auction, you get carried away, and all of a sudden, I won. <laughs> so uh, they came in, the head of Sotheby's said, okay, uh, who are you? we never seen you before. And uh, I told him who I was, and he said, okay, uh, that's fine. Uh, do you have the money for this? I said, well, yes, but okay. She said, no, you, don't have to, you, you, you can leave at the side door, and nobody will know. Or you can tell people there are 100 reporters out there. And I said, I wanted to give it as a gift to the country, as a down payment on my obligation to pay back the country for the good fortune I've had. I came from very modest circumstances, and um, my parents never made more than $7,000 a year, and they did not graduate from high school. And so for, for me to be able to rise up and be able to afford something like that, I thought was a good thing in our country, and so I wanted to give it back to our country. And I've tried to do something that I call patriotic philanthropy, giving back to the country. So many different things I will do. I'll buy a copy of the Emancipation proclamation and give it to the presidents in the Oval Office now or fix the Washington Monument or other things to try to give back to the country um, for you know, the good fortune I've had. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, it's, it's, my, it's, it's my mother behind me. But, uh. <laughs> 
you have also been involved with a, with a zoo, right? Uh, yes, um, I'm a regent of the Smithsonian, and uh, the Smithsonian uh, was, uh, as all of you may know or may not know, uh, a man named James Smithson um, in 1830s left money to the United States to create some kind of uh, organization for the diffusion of knowledge, and he had never been to the United States. He left the $500,000. The United States was suspicious of anybody in Britain giving money that we didn't know, so they debated it for three years. Finally, they took the money, they lent and lost it, but then Congress repaid the money, and now they've built a series of 19 museums and other things, but they also own the National Zoo. And the National Zoo um, is one of the four zoos in the United States that has the most popular species on the face of the earth. Remember this, 99% of all the species who are on the face of the earth are extinct. Now, 99% of all the species that ever existed are gone. There are five million species left. Humans are one, pandas are another. And uh, pandas are the most popular species. So as a regent, they came in and explained that the Chinese don't give these pandas away anymore, they rent them. They rent them for a million dollars a year, a male and a female, and uh, there are four zoos in the United States that have them, and there are about 20 other zoos around the world, and if, you, if they reproduce, they, 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 the offspring ultimately goes back to China. And uh, there are, it's an interesting phenomenon. We have seven billion people on the face of the earth. When I was born, there were two and a half billion people. Now there's seven billion. Before I'm projected to die, actuarially, there'll be nine billion people. Um, there are only 1,600 pandas. Now why are there so few pandas and there's so many people. Well, the reason is this. Pandas have a unique way of reproducing. No other mammal has this system. The female can reproduce only four hours a day, one day a year. So it's a very limited time frame. So the way it works is in the wild, the female will leave some scents on a tree saying, well, in four weeks I'll be ready to reproduce. The male will pick them up and he'll leave a scent saying, four weeks I'll be there. Three weeks, three weeks, two weeks, two weeks. When they get together in the wild, the problem is they're so inexperienced, the parts don't go where they're supposed to go because they don't really know what to do. So in China, what they do is they show them movies in captivity of pandas mating. They call it panda porn. And it's... <laughs> It's designed to, to enable them to, to, to get the picture, but it doesn't seem to have the same effect as such a thing does with humans. So <laughs> the result is that very often you have to artificially inseminate them, and we did that in Washington recently, artificially inseminate a female because the male and female got together for this four-hour period of time. They were fighting, and all of, all of a sudden they, did, they, they called me and said, would you like to be there for the artificial insemination? I said, no, I don't think so. Would you like to be there for the extraction of the semen from the male? I said, definitely not. I don't want to be there for that. <laughs> So, um, but the point of this really is I like to analogize it to what's going on in Washington. Members of Congress know what they're supposed to do, but they don't know how to do it. And pandas know what they're supposed to do, but they don't know how to do it either. So, <laughs> members of Congress aren't really getting that much done, unfortunately. And maybe the pandas are actually more productive than members of Congress in some ways. You are an acute and well-informed observer of Washington politics. What do CEOs in Latin America should expect, should expect that is coming their way from Washington? How, what, what was going to happen in terms of economic policy, yeah. the tapering? Uh, the well, economy? I think if you have low expectations, you won't be disappointed. <laughs> um, Right now, we have a situation in Washington where the president is really not that popular. As we all know, his popularity ratings are pretty low. In fact, George W. Bush, who wasn't thought to be that popular, his rankings to the ratings today are higher than President Obama's, which is hard to believe when you consider how unpopular George W. Bush was at one point. President Obama today is in a difficult situation. The Republicans pretty much can block what they want to block in the Congress. And there's a general view in Washington, conventional wisdom today, the Republicans have a pretty good chance of getting the Senate next time. So in November, if the Republicans pick up the Senate, and they already have the House, and they'll probably keep the House, they will control Congress. And for the last two years of his administration, the President will get very little things, very little done. That's why in his State of the Union, he said he would do a lot of things administratively. So right now, um, I don't think he's going to get anything through Congress of any consequence, nothing at all, no immigration reform. Uh, tapering is something he has nothing to do with, and that will continue, but it'll continue, you know, spur, you know as, as the... Uh, head of the Federal Reserve outlined it, but I don't think we're likely all of a sudden, all of a sudden when tapering is over to have interest rates go up. The, uh, the chairman of the Fed said recently probably wouldn't happen for quite a while. So interest rates will stay low for a while. Um, I think that um, uh, in Congress, uh, there's just no interest in passing anything. And the president normally in a second term, when he can't get anything done, a, nor a president normally spends time on foreign policy. The president doesn't seem to be as interested in some of these foreign policy things as maybe other his predecessors. He's, uh, John Kerry's doing a lot of it. And, uh, but the president is in a difficult situation. I, I, I empathize with his problem. He's got all the power in the world, theoretically, but he doesn't really have the ability to get a lot of things done in Washington right now. What CEOs in Latin America expect is not a lot of change 
in foreign policy from the United States, or what you now see, and not a lot of change in economic policy. I, I'd say the tapering will probably have some adverse effect uh, on emerging markets, and we're beginning to see that a bit, and so I suspect that'll continue a bit. Which countries in Latin America are you now considering uh, in terms of investments? Well, my firm uh, invests uh, in certain countries in Latin America. The, ones that we're, the one that we're most focused on, obviously, is Brazil, because it's the biggest GDP. It has, uh, I think, the greatest potential. It's the fifth biggest country in the world, population-wise, sixth biggest country in the world in terms of GDP. Um, I, I think it's uh, a country that um, it has great potential. Obviously, people have always said it had potential, but it has some problems, for sure. Uh, I don't want to make it sound like it's easy to get deals done there. We have done a number of deals there. We have a large team there. But you have to recognize that Brazil is not growing at 5% as it once was a couple years ago. And they have some problems on resource uh, development and actually extracting some of the resources that they have discovered. So I would say uh, we, love, we like Brazil. We are heavily, heavily involved there. Uh, we also like Peru. While Peru is a much smaller economy, uh, the, the GDP of Brazil is roughly $2.3 trillion. The Brazil, I mean, the GDP of Peru is roughly $41 billion, so it's much smaller, but there's not that much private equity uh, competition, and there are a lot of good uh, opportunities there, so we're there as well. Uh, we have been in Mexico, and we've looked at whether Mexico is something we should go back to. Mexico has a very large economy as well, about uh, $1.3 trillion, I think, uh, something like that, and it's got a, you know, a deregulation of oil is now coming, and the energy sector produce a lot of good opportunities. Um, the areas that uh, uh, we like are consumer-oriented kinds of companies. One's where play to the middle class. The growing middle class in Latin America is probably where we try to invest. Companies that will, that will sell products to those kind of uh, uh, constituents because the middle class is growing. Now, obviously, Latin America has a big income inequality problem. Of the uh, 15 countries in the world that have the worst income inequality, 10 are in Latin America. So there's a gigantic problem and one out of three people in Latin America live in what is called poverty. So it's not as, as uh, all of a sudden, you know, everybody's getting wealthy, but there are enough people in the middle class to make it possible to invest in companies that appeal to the middle class and then I think do well. As you know, the widespread expectation is that the next, uh, the coming years for Latin America are not going to be as good as the decade we, we just left uh, for, uh, you know, yes. commodity prices and easy money and all, all that. So uh, are you already detecting uh, drops in asset values? Are you already, f are you finding now bargains in Brazil or in Mexico or in other countries that are, uh, have assets become more attractive price-wise? Well, clearly um, things are cheaper than they were at some point and and uh, therefore, the you know, opportunity to buy at lower prices is there. Uh, and you have to you know, take a look at what the future is going to be. So is the economy going to be pressed for a long time? Nobody really knows. Um, right now, the concerns that people have are you still have a large income inequality problem. You, you, you have a um, problem that three quarters of the exports from Latin America are commodity based. So when commodity prices tend to go down, then it can hurt the economy. And as tapering occurs in the United States, that will have some adverse effect. On the other hand, uh, what's happened in Latin America in the last 10 years is pretty uh, interesting. You have a higher percentage of people getting educated. You have a higher percentage of people in the middle class. You have government debt down dramatically from where it was. Inflation and uh, currencies are not a big of a problem as it used to be. And generally, the threat of military takeover in larger uh, economies is not quite what it once was at some point. Uh, the, th the thing that I think people should recognize, though, in looking at Latin America is that, is that it's going to take a while to make private equity as attractive in Latin America as, let's say, in the United States, because the quality of professionals isn't quite as deep, quality of financing isn't as readily available, um, the companies often aren't for sale. You know, you have to have somebody to sell something to you if you're going to buy something, and very often in Latin America there's not a big tendency to sell as much as there might be in the United States. One of the things I think is important to think about in terms of Latin America is that it has moved forward dramatically in the last 10 years, but so has the rest of the world. So actually, over the last 10 years, uh, Latin America's percentage of the world's GDP has actually gone down. Yeah, I think it was about 8.9%, now it's about 8.6%. So you know, what's happened is Asia has dramatically in, increased its percentage of GDP, and the percentage of infrastructure investments in, in Latin America is much below what it is in, say, Asia. And its percentage of people getting higher education in Latin America is much below. So there are a lot of opportunities for improvement, but still uh, we are very attracted to here because in part there's not as much competition and the signs are generally positive. I, will, I want to go back uh, about uh, compa comparing, having Latin America in a more comparative perspective with Asia. But before we, get, we go there, you once told me that uh, investing in Mexico is particularly difficult for private yes. equity firms. Yes. Why did you say that? 
Well, um, the reason I said that was because it was true, but um, <laughs> I was just in Mexico the last two days and I may have rethought my position, but let me explain. Um, you know, it takes two to tango. You, you can't you know, have great private equity if nobody will sell you anything. So in that economy, one man controls a very large percentage of the GDP. And a number Who is that? Uh, Carlos <laughs> Slim. He's a very talented businessman, but he has a very large percentage of, the, of the, the publicly traded value of the stock market. He owns a large percentage of it because of a couple of his holdings. So he's not selling anything to speak of. Then you have a number of other families that own a large percentage of the economy, and they don't tend to sell. Now, because in the United States, there's an estate tax, and therefore families uh, tend to have to pay the estate tax. They tend to sell, and there's a generational change. And also, there's not as big a tradition of staying in the family company. People do other things. In Latin America, it's more of a tradition of some one of the children staying in the family company and keeping it, and there's no estate tax generally, and therefore you can keep it going for many generations. And so many people in Mexico just don't sell their company, so there's not as much to buy. So we did have a fund there, and it did well, but it did very small deals. There just wasn't much to buy. I'm hoping that the situation will change. And the deregulation of energy and the deregulation of many other things in Mexico makes me feel yeah, very comes. optimistic because you've got uh, a part of the economy that's so significant that was controlled by the government, I think the government will let other uh, investors come in. So um, based on my last two days there, I'm much more optimistic about the future of Mexican private equity than I was before I went. Let me take you back to your comparative perspective on Asia and Latin America. In investing in both regions, give us a compare and contrast. What, what do you see in Asia that it's more or less attractive and compare it to Latin America? Well, remember, in Asia, you have 60% of the world's population. Um, so in you know, Latin America, you have roughly, I'd say, 600 million people and a GDP of roughly $6 trillion. So that's very good. But in, in, in Asia, you have uh, one economy, China, which is by itself $8 trillion and will be the largest economy in the world in your lifetime and my lifetime. Then you've got India, which will probably be the second or third largest economy in the world in your lifetime and my lifetime. So the size is so much greater in China and India. The entrepreneurial instincts in China are actually pretty impressive. One out of every 10 adults in China is an entrepreneur by the UN definition. That means they all have some businesses on the side or they have their own main business. And that's a very high percentage. And when I go to China, and I go there very frequently, and I talk to government officials, they know more about my business than I think I do. They really know about investments in private equity. When I talk to members of Congress, I have to explain the difference between a mutual fund and a private equity fund and a hedge fund. Sometimes they don't know. But in China, the reason they welcome people like me is they think we're, they're in effect renting my expertise for a few years. We'll buy a company, we'll make the company better, we'll teach the Chinese how we do it, and then ultimately we'll sell it to a Chinese and they ultimately will stay there. The same is true in India. A very large population, hard place to make money. We've done a lot of good deals in China, made a lot of money. We've done not as well in India because because there's not as many things to buy, but India will ultimately become, I think, the second or third largest market in private equity in the world because of the size of its population. And then you've got Indonesia and Korea and Taiwan. So there's a lot of very good companies. Remember, the infrastructure in Asia is pretty spectacular. If any of you have been to the airports in Beijing or Shanghai or Hong Kong or, or Singapore, you see airports that, that are embarrassed the rest of the world. What we have in the United States is not very impressive. The infrastructure throughout uh, parts of Asia is spectacular. In Latin America, obviously, the infrastructure investing has been much lower as a percentage of GDP than in, in, in Asia. How do you compare the human capital, the quality of the average uh, professional you hire in Latin America or in uh, Asia? Well, what would you expect me to say? Uh, the, the truth. <laughs> Um, I would say a lot of people in Asia are increasingly in, uh, educated, people that we tend to hire, are educated in the United States. They tend to, let's say, go from China or India or Korea, Taiwan, and, and Japan, and they come to the United States for business school typically, and they work here a couple years in the United States, and then they go back. So they're pretty well trained or educated, and I think that's a big advantage. They also have a large population, large number of people to pick from. Uh, the people that we've hired in, in Latin America are very, very talented. Many of them have uh, uh, business school degrees from the United States, and that's not the only good place to get with them. So I would say it's hard to say. It depends on the individual. There's a bigger talent pool, obviously, because there's more people in, in, in Asia. Um, one of the most interesting things about Asia is this. I would say 20 years ago, when the best Asians came to the United States for business school, they stayed in the United States. Now, because of what's going on in China and India and Indonesia and Korea, they're going back. So you have very talented people going back there. And what about corruption? Compare and contrast corruption in Asia with corruption in Latin America. 
Well, I do want to leave. That's the, an easy question. I do want to leave the country <laughs> today, so I have to be careful how I answer this. Look. Um, when I worked in the White House as a young man, uh, we drafted something called the, Far the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and um, it was a, you know, a, a revolutionary thing in those days because corruption or bribes was not an uncommon thing uh, around the world. The United States changed its policy. It's still a complicated policy to understand, but generally it's recognized what Americans can do and cannot do. So we are very careful about it, and you have to be very careful uh, you know, in doing this. One time we were looking at a company, I won't mention the part of the world, but it's not a part of the world we're talking about now, where um, they had a very talented um, uh, accountant in the company, and we went to do the due diligence, and the accountant pridefully said, well, here's all the list of all the bribes we've given in our last 20 years, very carefully, you know, set forth. So, you know, obviously you can't buy that kind of company. Um, I'd say um, we are very cautious about it. We t you tend to avoid companies that deal with the government, because when you deal with, when companies that deal with the government a lot, you, there's a higher probability of something like that happening. But I don't want to say that one part of the world is better than the other part of the world or one part of the world is worse. They have this everywhere. And the United States is not free of these things. We, United States, we, we call, we use different names for things. But, uh, you know, the United States is not a, not a perfect country either. Tell us about your plans. What, are you, what, what is next for you? Well, I am 64 years old. So, uh, you know, when you turn 50, you can pretend you lived half your life and you uh, can say, well, I got another 50 years to go, you might not make it, but you, you, nobody on their 50th birthday is upset that they're about to die. When you turn 60, you do look at the world differently because you realize you've lived more than you're probably going to live. And I notice when I turn 60, a lot of people come up to me and they say, well, David, you look good today. Well, how was I supposed to look? <laughs> well, but you look good today. And, uh, you know, at the Kennedy Center, where you pointed out, I'm the chairman, I have these young women who escort me around from various events, and they're like 24, 25 years old, and they say, well, Mr. Rubenstein, there's seven steps here. Can you walk these steps, or you want to take the elevator? <laughs> so I kind of say, you know, I, I, the world's different. Um, I'm writing a book about my life, and the kind of the working title is Sprinting to the Finish Line, because I realize now I, I have more money and access and, and uh, you know, ability to do things than I did when I was in my 20s or 30s, but I don't have in many years. So I want to get everything done. I don't want to be on my deathbed and say, I wish I'd done that, I wish I'd done this. So I'm trying very hard to run my company with my uh, co-CEO and a lot of other people in the firm and then give away the bulk of my money. I signed the giving pledge. I was one of the first 40 people in the world to sign it with Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. And I'm going to give away, you know, more than half my money. Um, um, my my, my uh, well, it's selfish when I'm doing it because I have a theory that when you give away money, you help other people, you'll feel better about yourself. When you feel better about yourself, you live longer. How many people, <laughs> how many people give away money and say, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I helped, hadn't helped those poor people. I feel bad about myself. You feel better about yourself and people that feel better about themselves live longer. Grumpy people, they don't live as long. So I hope to live longer. And I also think that maybe I get it, you know, you get to heaven more quickly. Now I can't prove it, but well, I don't, why should I take a chance? So I am committed to giving away my money and uh, my children are you know, more or less okay with it because uh, you know, they recognize that the truth is um, when you grow up with an enormous amount of money and your parents give it to you, it's, it's not as big an advantage as you might think. And the people that do the great things in the world, they didn't inherit gigantic sums of money on, on average. Like how many people won Nobel Prizes for after they inherited $500 million? Probably not that many people. The people that do great things in the world are people that really have modest economic means and work hard and they really push to do something useful with themselves. We have just uh, five minutes uh, before uh, we, we're out of time. I want to conclude this conversation by asking you about a subject you mentioned, uh, and that is inequality, economic inequality. As you know, President Obama, the Pope, they, they have said that this is the defining issue of our time. Inequality has always been there, but in recent years it has become more acute, more visible. There are more debates about right. it. Give me your takes, your take on it. What, what do you think, and both about the causes and what are your preferred okay. ways of uh, dealing with that? Well, income inequality is one thing, and it's gotten worse in the United States since, since in the last couple of years, and probably it's now so bad that I think the people in the Forbes 400, those 400 people have more net worth than the people in the bottom 20% of the entire population. So it's not good. And now 1% of the highest income people in the United States make as much as people in the bottom 20%. So this is not a very good thing. But I think most important people have to focus on is, is social mobility. You know, I, I don't think you can change overnight the ability of uh, people to get more wealth and taxing the people at the upper end isn't going to, there aren't enough of them to really make a big difference. But you have to make sure the people at the bottom feel they have a chance to 
go up. And right now, we are losing a sense in the United States that you have a chance to rise up. I felt that I could rise up, but you know, I'm not sure today people feel they have a chance to rise up, particularly minority population. Um, so that's a big thing. Now, my thing, I don't have a solution that, that nobody else has come up with. It's education. In the city you live in and I live in, Washington, D.C., 25% of the people who enter the ninth grade in high school do not graduate. So when 25% of the people are dropping out of high school, that is going to produce a lot of problems because those people will earn less, they'll be more involved in the criminal justice system, and that's a big problem. So we've got to fix our K-12 system in the United States as a long term. But I, I think around the world, education is the best solution, I think, to income inequality. But you know, there are other solutions as well, but that's the best. As you know, the main culprits, of the, 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 the reasons that people must mention are, one is uh, technology. Technology right. that uh, essentially creates less need for workers yes. and lower salaries. Uh, the other is globalization. You know, jobs lost to India, to China, to yes. Asia, to places where salaries are lower. The third is crony capitalism. Is essentially governments that are taken over by the wealthy, and then the foreign, the, the policies uh, of these countries are uh, distorted by the special interests that benefit people in finance, for example, at the expense of the, gen of the general population. Which of the three reasons do you feel is, um, has more weight in explaining the current situation of uh, uh, economic inequality in, in well, the United States? Well, it depends States? on the country, of course. Um, in certain countries, obviously, crony capitalism will be more prominent than prevalent than other countries. I think around the world, globalization has been a good thing, but it is shifted. Um, the availability of jobs. I think in the end, you have to get educated for what the current market will let you do. And so, you know, being trained in certain areas isn't going to be as important as being trained in other areas. But in the end, um, I, I do still think that education is the great equalizer. Um, I came from modest circumstances. I got a good education. And I think that's the most important thing you can do to kind of break the back of this problem. But it's not going to happen overnight, and it's going to take the work of a lot of people, uh, for sure. But clearly, when young people don't have a sense that there's a greater uh, uh, way to live their lives than they may have grown up in, then that is, that's really a sad situation. And I, we haven't reached that point in the United States, but we aren't, um, I think, a lot of many people don't feel as socially uh, upwardly mobile um, as maybe they should. But you have always been very hopeful and very optimistic about the ability of the United States to change course and deal and tackle problems. That's one of our great strengths. We, we reinvent ourselves all the time, and uh, the United States has many problems for sure, but our ability to reinvent ourselves and, and adapt is different. Many other countries are very static, and they just don't make change as much, and one of our great uh, things in the United States is our ability to reinvent ourselves, new technologies, and, and to encourage smart people to really do something useful. For example, take Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, um, other Google, why are those companies based in the United States? Could those entrepreneurs have actually built those global companies if they'd been started in some other country? Maybe, but so far, a lot of these great companies that are changing the world have been based in the United States. I think it's because of the culture in the United States and Silicon Valley, and I think other countries, if they could replicate it, would be better off. David Rubinstein, we wish you a long life and that you continue <laughs> to give a lot of money away. Thank Please you very much. <laughs>